So I first became interested in video games in the early 90s, it would have been about 93, 94, but my first ambition was to get into film and, you know, make movies, but uh, I got a job teaching drawing to some video game design students here in Vancouver, and uh, it was some of my students actually that started making video games and I started helping them and that's how I got involved in the first place. I got into video games professionally because a friend of mine, Alex Garden, who was actually one of my students at the time in, the, in my drawing class, just asked me one day, hey, you know, do you want to start a video game company with me? And I was like, sure, I got nothing better to do, let's do it. So me and Alex and like four other people uh, got together and, and started Relic Entertainment. So when we started Relic, it was the summer of 1997 and we were all punks. I was 26, Alex I think was 20, maybe 19 even, or 21, whatever. Luke was like 22. Aaron Cambitz was again, like we were all in our mid 20s. And we all got together at Alex's house one night to eat pizza and talk about this game called Homeworld that we were gonna make and this new game studio called Relic Entertainment that we were gonna create. And I thought, you know, got nothing better to do on a Friday. I'd never met these guys before. And it was like the next Saturday or a week later that we actually went down to Seattle to pitch it to Scott Lynch at Sierra. And, you know, it was, we had just barely met each other. We really had very little in the way of a pitch, but Alex was super enthusiastic and contagious with his energy. And, you know, Scott was great and the pitch went super well. After we left, we stood around in the parking lot. It was like an empty parking lot. It was a Saturday, there was no one no one there and uh, Scott phoned Alex on his cell and said hey you know like you guys are greenlit we're gonna we're gonna do this thing and so you know all of our lives pretty much changed like that day and like I think it was like a month later we had a whole bunch of money and started making Homeworld. For me the very origin of Homeworld was when Alex met me for a coffee, Alex Garden met me for a coffee one day and said, do you want to make this game with me and, and, and some other guys? And I was like, oh, what are you talking about? Yeah, you know. And, uh, and he described it as um, a merger of Command and Conquer meets Battlestar Galactica. So, you know, the story is your, you know, a lost civilization going back to your home world. Um, and the gameplay is basically Command and Conquer, but in space. So there'd be combat production and resourcing set in this 3D environment and that's what was going to be new about it. And it sounded super intriguing and super cool and you know, and I loved the RTSs of the day and thought that this would be a really cool uh, new thing that no one had really seen before. So in the early 90s, the games that were awesome back then was like Doom in 3D, which was amazing. Um, in the RTS genre, there were a couple standouts that we all played, like Command and Conquer, Red Alert, and you know Warcraft 2, and that was you know the the peak of RTS at the time, or Total Annihilation. At that time, in the in the mid 90s, RTS games were all top-down camera, uh, essentially 2D worlds with sprites of the various assets and vehicles and units moving around. So you know you'd had 256 sprites of buildings with vehicles driving around and those, those sprites were all uh, rendered rotations of the 3D model. So uh, it looked kind of 3D, but it was basically 2D. It was like a slideshow of 2D, 2D assets. So uh, the idea behind Homeworld was that we would not do that. We were gonna do actual 3D. And, and at the time, 3D was like a new thing that was just coming out. So we had like Doom and a couple other games that were kind of, that were actually in 3D. But this was gonna be the first 3D RTS. Uh, so the plan was to set it in space so that you would never have to render the terrain. So the terrain would have these huge uh, geometry and, and uh, texture uh, sync and we, would, we wouldn't have to worry about that because we were in space. That was, that was the idea. So therefore we could pile all of our budget into the ships uh, and the textures and, and the effects. So this kind of gave us an interesting opportunity because of the 3D nature of the game, we were going to do a, as close to realistic scaling as we possibly could. So in RTSs at the time, the vehicle that was manufactured by the factory was like almost the same size as the factory. Like, you know, a tank would come out of a tank building and the tank was like 85% the size of the, the building it came out of, which of course is completely unrealistic. So we thought, you know, how great would it be if 
the fighters and frigates and ships being produced were being produced from these much, much bigger ships. And, you know, so that's, that's what drove us, the, the 3D nature of the game and, and the scaling challenge. So we pitched Homeworld in the summer of 97 to Scott Lynch down at uh, Sierra Studios in Seattle. We drove down on a Saturday morning. Aaron Cambitz and I sat in my car and as we drove, we were showing each other the, the art that each one of us had made and it was all printed or magic markers, drawn pen drawings on paper right there in the car as we're driving down the highway and we'd never seen each other's art before. You know, so new was the, the, the founding members um, of the studio. And um, we got there and there was supposed to be another guy there but he couldn't show so it was just Scott and we laid out all the pictures on the table and Alex started, you know, explaining to Scott what the game was all about and making sound effects with his mouth and like shooting in the air with his fingers and describing this spaghetti ball, space battle, Star Wars, Battlestar Galactica experience set to this RTS game uh, model. So a spaghetti ball was Alex's nickname for fighter combat in the game, uh, particularly in the pitch of the game before actual fighter behavior uh, was implemented. Uh, and he described it as, um, as this spaghetti ball, because each fighter had like a trail, like an ion trail of gas that was, so that, you know, trailing behind it so you could tell where it was going, like a like ball of, you know, little sperms or whatever. And uh, when they'd all intermingle and fly around together, the, all the engine trails formed this sort of spaghetti ball. And, and so that, that's the nickname kind of stuck and that's where the term comes from. Scott didn't really say much in that pitch. He just smiled a lot and then, you know, said, I, I, I believe his exact words were, I think this will be an easy decision. Let me make one call. So we felt good and went outside and we stood around in the parking lot. Alex's phone rang and it was Scott and he said, you guys are good to go. Let's, let's make Homeworld. And we were like, what? This is, this is crazy. Uh, next thing we knew, we had a little studio and we rented an office above a nightclub and, <laughs> and then uh, started, started making Homeworld. And it was, uh, it was crazy, it was a lot of fun. Homeworld was, uh, the initial budget for Homeworld was $1 million and it was supposed to take one year. Um, that turned out to be three years and $3 million. Um, but every time we started running out of money, uh, Alex would rush down to Sierra and convince Scott to you know, free up another million. And we were all amazed that you know, this, this magic was happening. So the look and feel of the game was heavily inspired by um, the sci-fi images that Aaron Cambitz and I admired so much as kids ourselves in the 70s and early 80s. These like sci-fi um, book covers that were done by these artists like Peter Elson or Chris Voss, uh, John Harris. There were these spectacular paintings with, you know, covered in detail of these brightly colored ships that were you know, set to these spectacular um, backdrops and so forth. Very much unlike the, the gray, the, the amazing but, but gray ships of the Star Wars franchise, which of course was our, you know, inspiration as well at that, at that time. That look and feel combined with this realistic scaling was, was really what we wanted the, the game to sort of look and feel like. So the music of, of Homeworld was, was all composed, original score was composed by Paul Ruske in what I remember as just this amazing time where this, this music was coming like out of nowhere. Like I, I don't remember seeing any sketches or, or rough tracks, like just these finished compositions were coming out of Studio X and just going pretty much straight into the game. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was kind of amazing. Um, the Adagio for Strings, uh, Samuel Barber track, the, the, the sort of classical music that the, the game is themed to. Uh, allegedly, Alex Garden set his alarm clock one morning to a radio station halfway through Homeworld's production or early on in the production of the game. And uh, Adagio was playing when he woke up. And so he, he came to work that day and was like, I, I just had this amazing experience waking up to this track. Like, that's, that's the music for the game. Like, that's the, theme, that's the theme song. That's the song that's playing when the mothership launches. And we're like, oh my God. And we played it and we all listened and we're like, that's the song. No, 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 no. You know, it was great. The Ladder uh, was a track that was made by the 70s super band 
yes, they somehow heard of the game, or I'm not sure what the story was there, but uh, one, some member of the band heard about the game or played the demo or something and thought it was cool, thought the story was cool, and it aligned with what they were doing with that album at the time. So they made a track that sort of fit with the game, and Sierra and them thought it would be cool to, you know, make the whole 70s thing happen with the art and the, and the song, and that was what we went with for a credit song. It was a lot of fun meeting those guys. The founding team for Relic each had some experience making games uh, in the past, but not a great deal. Like I had worked on one game before Homeworld. It was a 2D RTS. The innovation there was that the tops of the buildings would come off and you'd see guys go inside. I know Aaron Cambitz and Aaron Daly, Luke and Alex had all worked at various game studios in the past. I know Alex had worked, I think, at EA for a bit. Aaron worked at Radical for a bit. So we, we had a, a little bit of experience, but really not a lot. Like we were coming in kind of as rookies. None of us had uh, undertaken something of this magnitude and of this level of technical innovation. Um, and to be honest, we had, even when we pitched it and started production on it, we had no idea what we were getting into. We, <laughs> that beast just made itself and we were along for the ride, you know? There was really just one problem on Homeworld, and that was that it was a, a, going to be a 3D game, and we were going to be set in space, and the camera was going to be this mad orbital camera that you could ro rotate around and zoom in and out um, with unprecedented flexibility. Like, no game at that time had that kind of camera flexibility. Not even close. So, you know, you could zoom right into a fighter, and it would fill the screen, and then zoom right out until it became, like, three pixels. Like, you know, and, and that fighter had to fly in front of a gigantic mothership and the texture had to hold up, you know, like pretty much every technical and creative problem on that game was a, a, a child of this main issue, which was the 3D nature of the game. And for us at the time, that was a really big deal. You know, there was hardly any graphics cards, you know, there was a software version of the game when we put it out. No one had, had solved these problems in a, in really, hardly any games, much less a strategy game with so many assets on the board at once. We had to come up with all sorts of solutions for um, polygon count, for you know, texture budget, um, render space. You know, there was, computers were, were totally crap in, in 97 and 98, 99. I was kind of amazed anyone could even run the game when we released it in 99. In addition to the 3D uh, challenge at the time, uh, memory budget was a big deal. If I'm not mistaken, the entire uh, t uh, texture budget for the, for the whole game, the texture footprint was like, you know, 32 megs. So we had to come up with solutions for, um, you know, t tex texturing all of the ships, uh, the, all of the effects and all of the, the backgrounds as well. That was, a, that was another big challenge that, that we had to solve. Because the game was home, called Homeworld, we had to tell the story of the Homeworld, whatever that was. So we knew it was something about going home. Uh, but we really didn't have a clue how we were going to tell this story or, or what the story even was. Um, as we started getting into production, we, we realized that we were vastly under-resourced to pull off anything that resembled a decent story and had to come up with some solutions on how we were going to do that for basically no money. Again, in, in the mid-late 90s, there was no off-the-shelf video game uh, development software. So, everything had to be built by hand. So we had to build all of the uh, tools and uh, technology that would run the game sim right there in house. So as a function of the 3D environment the game was going to be set in, uh, the camera was pretty much uh, like a primary sort of problem that we had to solve. Subsets of the camera problem involved orienta visual orientation so you didn't get lost in the game. Uh, making positive ID on, on ships and you, so that you knew who was where because they were the scale involved in the different ships was so extreme and the distances were so extreme that we had to come up with solutions for how do you keep track of everything in a strategic, um, in a strategic game uh, and also technically how are you going to actually render this stuff like this was 99 and you know there was no hardware graphics cards or very bad ones and, and um, 
you know, how are we going to actually render this stuff on screen? Because of the 3D nature of the environment that you are playing the game, the player had to control the camera. We couldn't do a fixed camera for, for this style of game. Uh, it would have just been impossible to stay in, in, in control of your units and know where things were on the, on the strategic board. So Aaron Daly designed this magnificent camera that took into account uh, zoom levels so that you could, you could zoom in and out on, on ships very quickly. With, uh, you could refocus on uh, different elements of the ships and the environment based on selection set and other elements. You could rotate in full 360 orbits um, from underneath the units, but then equatorially and then above the units as well. But uh, you could never go past a pole. So the camera would never rotate past the north or south pole of its rotational axis. And this would prevent orientation. So one of disorientation, sorry. So one of our big concerns was the players losing orientation where they wouldn't know which way was up. They wouldn't know what the hell they were looking at. We experimented with different camera models and the one that Aaron chose, which was the correct one, was this um, e extremely flexible camera that could refocus and zoom um, and orbit, but then it, it was fixed at, at the poles. Uh, that way everything was always, up was always up in the game. And then Aaron Cambitz and I would uh, designed all of the art in the game from the ships to the backgrounds. Um, Everything about the in-game environment supported this terrifying fear we had of the player losing orientation. So the famous um, banana mothership, the big vertical Kushan mothership, I, I designed that way because I couldn't think of a shape that was more obviously up-down. <laughs> like, that wasn't a vertical mothership because it was cool looking, though I, I thought it, it was cool. No one had done that before. But it was so that the player, no matter where they were in the world, they could look at the mothership and know that way is up. And so you're never going to get lost. Same deal for the Titan mothership, which was basically just a horizontal slab. And this just carried on throughout the game. So early in the game, uh, we knew we had issues with respect to the render uh, distance of the, of the computer. Like you, could, you just couldn't draw everything in the world. So there were going to be these limited uh, visibility. And as units became smaller and smaller, we realized quickly that you just couldn't tell what they were. So we implemented three basic solutions to this, to this problem. Um, and it was like a team effort. I, I forget who came up with these ideas. Um, the first was an, an LOD or level of detail system where as the unit became smaller on screen, as the camera zoomed away from it, it w the, the geometry and texture of the unit would switch between different versions of itself at lower polygonal counts and, and uh, until it got basically super tiny at LOD four. And then, and so, you know, now we're talking about a thing literally three pixels across on screen. But because pretty much everything turns into a blob at three pixels, we had to hand um, exaggerate each ship's profile at LOD4 so that its silhouette signature from maximum zoom distance was still recognizable. So this sounds barking mad, but it actually worked. So the LOD4 of the Titan fighters, for example, they had these little wings on the back that, you know, the, the silhouette was very important that each ship had its own character and you could tell what everything was. Um, those guys had little wings on the back. And so at LOD4, you know, the, the wings were like, you know, three times the, the size of the ship so that when it reduced down to three pixels on screen, <laughs> one of those pixels was vertical and then there was a middle pixel, and then there was a bottom pixel, and you're like, oh, that's a Titan fighter. And you know, there was yellow, it was like one of the pixels was yellow and the other one was red, and that, that's how we did it. So we just basically did that with every ship in the fleet so that you could maintain um, you know, visual identity of the ships. The second thing we did was um, when, the, when the, the render list, at the very limits of the render list, even with LOD4, it was, it was really hard. <laughs> to tell you know who those guys were especially when they're like smonging around in a great big like spaghetti ball so we implemented what we called the tactical overlay system which is inspired by the uh, you know heads up display in fighter jets or the radar screens in air traffic control um, screens radar screens so there were these little symbols for that corresponded to each class of unit uh, that would get drawn um, in the distance so that you had feedback on what the hell was going on in the game so that was the second solution to that problem and the third and probably the most difficult solution to this uh, 3D render and visual identity game board problem that we had was Aaron Daly's solution for 
what later became the census manager. So in the, in the early part of the game, the plan was you would have a render sphere and then when units got to the edge of the render sphere, they, they would create a new, basically a new render sphere elsewhere and that you would, you would have to manually toggle between the two render spheres of the game and we called them away missions, kind of like, you know, like in Star Trek where the, you know, the guys went down to the planet or whatever. That proved untenable almost immediately, but Daly came up with a great solution where all of the render balls were rendered in a single epic render um, sphere. So this was inspired by the minimap that would usually happen in the bottom left hand uh, corner of the screen in RTSs. It's like a little thumbnail of the whole map and you would see all the units you know, moving around. You knew where things were and you could click your camera there and it was visible at all times. And we actually tried that and we had this like 3D globe thing. But you couldn't, it was impossible. You couldn't see anything there. It was like, you know, you had like dozens of units fighting in like these in this tiny little corner of the screen so we abandoned the mini map and went with a full screen mini map <laughs> which we later called the census manager and each of the units fog of war uh not the render list but the actual fog of war of the units which is more important for the player gameplay wise was rendered as a blue sphere in that environment and then we made it like sound cool and Ruske gave it that iconic sound when it zooms in and out and it was like this awesome sort of digital map in 3D digital map environment and it became a very important part of the strategy of the game without which you essentially kind of couldn't play the game and you could move around between the different render distances involved in, 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 this, in this environment. So that, that's kind of how we, those three things are more or less how we solved. There were a bunch of other things too but those were the main th ways we got around this huge challenge of, you know, creating a 3D environment for a, a space strategy game, but not completely being confused. So when we started the, the company and we started uh, the game, uh, because we were so young and inexperienced, we, and, and we had no idea what we were up against, um, I think we went back to Sierra at least twice for project extensions and budget increases. Um, I, I don't, I don't remember how many times, but it was definitely at least twice. So, so what that created was a production environment that was ki kind of uh, insane. Like, you know, luckily we were all young and had no lives, so you know, we lived at the office, literally lived at the office. Like, I think Cambit slept under his desk for like eight months and. You know, everybody's girlfriend left them, you know, like it was, we were all in, uh, you know, like, like fanatics to get this thing built. And the, the, the pressure was so high that the first solution that we had to come up with for each problem had to be the final solution. And there was no iterative process whatsoever. So, uh, you know, like we would, you know, we wrote the story and, and like, you know, like the first draft of the, I think we I think the shooting script was like the second draft of the of the of the story. Um, you know, Aaron Cambitz single-handedly did all of the animatics and cutscenes between each mission by himself, and he literally would sit down and just do them all. And the first time anyone saw them was when they were just coming out of the render at the end. Uh, and then he'd like put it on a jazz drive and like run it across the street to Studio X and Paul would just like cut the music and put the final music and like no one had heard the music or anything and so literally like these things would, would come out of nowhere and be final and we because we had no time like you know all of the backgrounds uh, I did with the proprietary background a garage shaded vertex shader thing that Alex and, and the guys built at, uh, at the studio and you know there was no tweaking those things like every single one that was the that was what we were doing you know that was the final one um, and it was like that for, for pretty much everything I'm, only the ships got like a, a, a second uh, iteration of, of design work done and that was because Aaron Cambitz came up with the solution for how do you get a spaceship to look cool with like <laughs> like a you know, 24 by 24 pixel texture, like, you know, like, uh, so when he figured that, that out, then we had to redo, like, the, 
like the whole game again in the, with this method and that's that's why the game is so consistent looking because we basically did it twice and the second time we knew what we were doing part of the solution to the 3d orientation problem was how do you uh, visually make sure people know uh, what is the horizontal plane what is the vertical plane so um, the of course the the motherships were horizontal and vertical which enhanced this uh, by design which enhanced this this orientation but in addition uh, the movement mechanism uh, GUI that would come up when you move units had like a horizontal disk uh, we went over you know we, we took pains in the census manager to show um, horizontal planes even the backgrounds um, were designed to be very dominantly horizontal in nature so that no matter where you were in the environment you always saw like a horizontal band of the um, of looking edge on into the galaxy so which which supported the story too because I was um, sort of a, a ho am amateur sort of a hobbyist in, in astronomy and just loved astronomy so I loved this idea that you were going from sort of the boondocks of the galaxy more or less where we are in the Milky Way all the way across the galaxy to the galactic core and, and as you went hyperspace after hyperspace jumping many thousands of light years across uh, this you know 80,000 light year journey um, you'd see the, the galaxy getting you know progressing much like chasing the sunset on a road trip west across you know cr across America or something um, and there was this no matter where you were in space there was always this kind of visual orientation both vertically and, hor uh, and horizontally but also um, narratively a across the story as you as you got deeper and closer to your homeworld and you know and the sky got warmer and brighter as you got closer to the galactic core of these old stars that were burning you know gold in the sky um, and things got weirder you know you'd, you'd see these big hulks and you know, like the Karos graveyard hulks floating in the sky. And we never explained what any of that stuff was to the player. Like, they were just like, what is that? Like, I don't know, it's just like stuff. Those were some of the solutions we came up with um, to, to help with that orientation issue. In the census manager, which was the map of the game, the full screen map of the game, we had to show the player what the fog of war was so on a regular top-down 2d rts you could do that with like a darkened area and the units would sort of you know eat away at this um at this dark area and reveal the fog of war and you could see enemy units or not see them if they were outside the fog of war so we had to come up with a solution for that in 3d um, with many units over a vast uh, environment at a huge scale uh, issues uh, and with the zooming camera as well so uh, the solution Aaron Daly came up with was these um, spherical blue, th these spherical, somehow we would show these spheres in the, w in the world um, and Aaron and I designed it to sort of look like this digital environment, this, that's how they kind of turned blue, but the blue blobs were, were um, fog of war balls. They were kind of renderlists too, I guess, because if you went into, the, if you zoomed into one of them, the fog of war was pretty much the render list as well, like units would appear out of nothing when the unit detected, when, when one of your units detected it. So they kind of, that, that's how the blue blob thing kind of happened. When we were developing the narrative, um, we knew that it was some kind of homecoming story. Um, Dave Williams came up with the concept of the uh, exodus from Higara to Karak, which was uh, uh, this planet that the, the player is told at the beginning of the story that they're not indigenous to this planet, but you know, we found this thing in the desert and it was a guide stone and it was this like Rosetta stone that proved that we weren't from here and that was actually from over there and that we, there's this, you know, this hyperspace core and so you build a mothership and you go. Um, but at the time, we, own, we had some very rudimentary in-game uh, NIS tools to cover some in-game assets for storytelling. We could put voiceover and music to them, but we couldn't show really any story because it was all the in-game assets. So we couldn't do interiors or characters or other locations. And, and we had no way of delivering mission objectives to the player either. So we, we had this kind of crisis in, in the production where Alex or Scott or someone basically took us aside and said, you guys have to, in this meeting, come up with 
how we're going to fix this and give us a plan like by end of day tomorrow. So there was this super intense meeting where we, we basically sat around, the leads of the, the project sat around the table and came up with the, the following solutions. So Aaron Cambit said, well, you know, why don't we just do animatics? And everyone was like, what's an animatic? And Cambit is like, it's this 2D animation that, you know, and we're all like, oh, that sounds lame. Like, what are you talking about, man? And he's like, don't worry, I'll, I'll do a test and, and uh, we'll check it out. And so we're all like, okay, well, and then uh, Aaron Daly was like, you know, we need a way to give the player mission objectives during the, during the game. And so I said, well, why don't we just create a new character called Fleet Intelligence, and this individual just talks to you the whole time, and we just use the tutorial pointer system, which we had already developed at the time, to identify three-dimensional locations in the world using the census manager, um, and that this character would talk to you and talk to you over the animatics and talk to you over the game and use the tutorial and the census manager, combine all of those things to create mission objectives. And combined with the in-game NIS system, uh, we are able to you know, tell uh, the story of the game, <laughs> which, which at the time we were like just terrified was just gonna suck. It was just gonna be terrible, you know, like, oh my God, you know, like we're gonna just be torn apart for how cheap and lame this is. But you know, it was it, was, it wasn't so bad, and it turned out that that that's you know people loved it. You know, of course, that's probably because like our audience at the time were like twelve, so <laughs> of course they loved it. You know, um, but uh, but it was pretty intense. And and the, during the production of, of those assets, those those solutions, uh, there was no time for iteration. So really, the first version of of everything that we came up with was like the final one. So. Cambits would do like one version of every animatic and, and that was the final one and Ruske would put just final music and sound design on each one and there was like there was no second version of anything like I think the, the actual missions themselves got some got some iterating like the gameplay mission objectives and stuff but but all of the storytelling devices pretty much went from nothing version one ship it uh, that we just had no time the same with backgrounds like all the backgrounds just version one was the one that, that, that shipped with the game. So there was kind of an amazing thing that happens though when a, a creative and technical endeavor is, is put under that kind of pressure with those constraints. There's a kind of a magic that takes place and some, something intervenes and just makes you come up with something great just because you have to. It's kind of hard to describe, but, but it's, it's kind of like that whole thing where like the sketch is better than the final piece, you know? Like all of Homeworld was just one huge sketch. All of those assets, all of that production happened in a very tight time period in the, like the, the last six months of the game, maybe eight months. So we were all watching the calendar, like you know, assets were being measured in, in days and uh, uh, literally it was, it was crazy. Aaron Cambit slept in a sleeping bag under his desk like every night, like the guy never went home for six months. Like we would bring him food and stuff. Like, you know, the tools we were using to to make the effects and the background were were in-house tools that were, like, as we were using them, the programmers were updating them and adding features. Like the background tool, for example, like, you know, they were they were adding functionality to that tool as we were building backgrounds, you know, on the fly. So, you know, all of the music Ruske created, like, I don't I don't know what Ruske's magic voodoo internal process really was but it looked to me like he was pretty much just like the the first thing he did was the, the thing that was the final piece you know he'd be like oh, hey listen to this thing it's kind of weird but I kind of dig it and we were all like oh my god that's amazing that's totally the right vibe so it was a very high pressure environment um, but we were all you know fine comfortable with it it was a lot of fun everybody got along really well and uh, yeah it happened <laughs> Looking back, uh, I, I would say that one of the biggest things that's changed uh, since that time um, is sort of the experience that we've all had as kind of as an industry. That includes the technology and the tools that are available. You know, when you have talent like that working together and the, the personality uh, is chemistry is good, that you just have faith in each other to just 
just do it. Just like, hey man, this is in your department. Just, this is an impossible mission. Do it, fix it, make that happen. And that was just happening all the time. And I guess, you know, that experience was really um, powerful for me and I think everyone on the Homeworld team as we grew the studio and got onto other projects. And we kind of got spoiled on, on Homeworld because there was so much of that, so much respect and so much talent that, you know, on the future games that we worked on, we just kind of like expected that to be the case because why wouldn't that be the case? But then we learned that that's not always the case, but that's something to strive for and, and, and how important that, that is and not to be taken for granted. Well, it's interesting looking back, the creative and technical challenge of, of Homeworld seemed so impossible at the time. We just really had no idea what we were doing and we just we just went for it anyway and it was that kind of blind faith and trust in each other and that just kind of like kind of made it happen and so since then in in at least in my career i i haven't really ever had that level of just barking mad you know like there's no way this is going to work like every project since homeworld it's like there's, there's a pretty decent chance it's going to work. <laughs> you know, maybe it's not 100%, but it's better than 50. Whereas when we started Homeworld, it felt like, oh man, like this, this isn't going to work. I, I guess like this, that, that faith in the creative process and the, and the, the technical, um, just the talent of the people involved is, is just so valuable and will actually solve the, the problem that you're facing. The technical story of Homeworld was uh, really just a, a story of, of discovery and just innovation. There was no precedent for anything like that before, so we just made it up as we went along and just Luke and his team, working with Daly and his team, they just, they just created solutions, like routinely. Like there was constantly designed document updates, there was constantly new uh, tools and, and uh, functionality. That, that, I mean, Gary would literally just, just decide to implement fighter behavior just because he felt that that today you know today he was just like hey guys i just did fighter behavior you know and we'll be like oh let's let's check it out you know like hey kamikaze is in you know and like so it's kind of you know there was a plan but it was kind of we were sort of all over the map and y y y yeah there were you know it was a bit it was kind of crazy looking back uh in the time since then some things have changed and some haven't uh you know uh, the creative process hasn't really changed and you know how you really make a game like you, you plan it there's pre-production production post-production post bug fixing there's methodologies but it really hasn't changed fundamentally however the technology base totally has and the, the systems uh, and the, the sheer horsepower of um, everything involved the, the, the development tools the you know memory um, you know allocations budgets the you know networking you know broadband like the way games are sold and bought, like pretty much everything that technology has touched has changed uh, for the better. Uh, so it's much easier to make stuff. It's much faster to make stuff. You can, you can update things quicker. You can get things into the hands of customers way more easily and frequently. Um, so when, when looking back at, at Homeworld 1 uh, to, to Homeworld 3, which we're working on now um, here at Blackbird, it's sort of this amazing journey of, of this creative process, which is basically kind of like this background rhythm that has just never really changes, but then running past it is this insane technological, just ex like slow motion explosion that's happening. So like, for example, the things we're doing now routinely on Homeworld 3, like literally every day uh, were, and, and this is going to sound flaky, but they were dreams that we were having about Homeworld 2 in 2001. Like, for example, like m massive megalithic structures just covered in detail that like motherships would be casting shadows onto and Strikecraft would be passing in and out of the, the nooks and crannies and, you know, atmospherics and like terrain gameplay in 3D, like these were dreams we were having in, in, in the early 2000s, which were absolutely impossible to execute on. And we tried, and we failed, and they couldn't be done. <laughs> and Homeworld 2 got totally canceled, and then restarted, and then we made Homeworld 2 essentially as kind of like a, a, like a visual upgrade 
basically of Homeworld 1 because that was what was technically possible uh, in 2003. But it's not 2003. It's a whole new ball game and, and now we actually can do those things. It's wild. And, and to be doing it at, at, a, at a brand new studio here at Blackbird is, is, uh, was a dream I, I never had in 2003 but is, is really pretty remarkable and I, you know, I kind of have to pinch myself every day. When THQ bought Relic in 2004, somewhere around 2006, 2007, we were working on a Homeworld game that was not Homeworld 3, it was like a third person kind of console, you know, skew. And it wasn't really working out and the, the whole THQ situation was kind of coming undone um, and, and I didn't really want to be there anymore so I left and started Blackbird and then early in Blackbird's uh, history when we were still in my garage the T THQ went bankrupt and they were the owner of the Homeworld IP at the time and so you know I thought it would be great if we could get the IP so we had our legal team unbundle the asset from the bankruptcy proceedings so that we could bid on it and buy the IP because I thought you know it's going to be worth nothing like no one's doing anything no one's done anything with this thing for, for years um, but as soon as we unbundled it it became you know public knowledge and soon this kind of bidding war happened um, and it it came and we got outbid like immediately like blown totally out of the water and and it went to gearbox for I believe one and 1.3 1.35 million we couldn't believe it and I congratulated Randy and I was like hey you know why did you guys buy this thing? Like, you guys are developers, you do like Borderlands and first person shooters and stuff. And he's like, we're just fans, we, you know, we just didn't want it to go to someone that was gonna mess it up. And, and I was like, well, that's great. <laughs> you know, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, what's the plan? And he's like, we have no plan. It was an impulse purchase, you know, Martel wanted it, I wanted it. And so, uh, so I was like, hey man, you know, we've been building this thing in my garage called hardware and it, you know, shipbreakers and it, and it kind of looks and feels like Homeworld, you should check it out. And so we showed it to Gearbox and uh, the Gearbox team thought it would make a great prequel um, to Homeworld 1 set because it's set on a desert planet. And, and so that's what we did. And, and that became Deserts of Karak and that's what launched uh, Blackbird Interactive. So the Homeworld story is kind of bound up in, in the story of Blackbird Interactive and, and Relic. And it was the thing that kind of started both studios. It's kind of weird actually now that I think about it. So our goals for Homeworld 3 are to just give the fans a satisfying, authentic Homeworld sequel experience. You know, sequels are so often lamer than the original. And, you know, I, I always liked Homeworld 1 more than 2. Like, 2 was cool in a ton of ways, but there was something special about 1 that I thought 2 sort of missed the mark on a little bit. I think our goals for 3 involve, you know, getting back to the... The, the, the true flavor and, and feeling of the original. Like, all, all of my, I, I'd be totally satisfied if we got emails from, you know, kids in their, you know, like 10, 12 years old, playing Homeworld 3 being like, oh, I totally cried, uh, this was amazing, it blew my mind, as well as like, you know, 30, 40 year olds who were like, this reminds me of when I was little, oh my God, I totally had like a kid flashback. And I mean, if, I, if we can capture both of those audiences and I think something you know really special has, has happened and I would declare victory there. So I, I think the title has aged so well because of the uniqueness of the tone and the, the vibe that it captured and um, you know there's certain cinematic elements to, to the experience of playing Homeworld uh, with the scale and the, the elasticity of the, of the visual experience that really transcend the artistic or technical achievement from 99. Like, that still holds up today. And the, uh, the emotional connection that people had with the title back then also kind of transcends the, the medium in which it, it, it kind of came through. Like, people, you know, looking back, remember it better than, you know, that it actually was. Uh, because it touched them emotionally and that feeling you, you had uh, was just so unique and, and iconic it, that nothing, it's, it's not like anything else.